This is the net filter boff. My colleague Josh Hunt and my name is Pete Bowman will be presenting um, sort of how Akamai uses IP set, some of the stuff we've ran into, and um, some of the changes we're looking forward to with NF tables. Um, it's kind of an outline of what we'll be talking about. First of all, we have an Etherpad set up that we'll be taking notes on so that we can kind of remember stuff that we talked about whenever we go back home. Um, then we'll go into the presentation, sort of optimized use of net filter components. We'll start off with describing our use of net filter components, some of the desired net filter interfaces that we're looking forward to. Um, we'll go into the internals of some of the changes we've made to net filter components um, so that we could scale them to how we use them in, in our environment. And then we'll go ahead and talk about um, NF tables and our trajectory, our path forward with NF tables and what we envision for that. If anybody has any presentations they would like to give related to net filter components, we should have time at the end for that. Or if you have topics you'd like to discuss, we'll definitely have time. I think Pablo and Patrick will continue their presentation from last night, uh, their tutorial from last night on NF tables during this time. And then if there's still time remaining, we'll have an open discussion. Great, so the system that Akamai uses for managing the firewall on all of our machines is force field. This is an internal application. Um, there's a lot of Akamai specific code in it. It was deployed around 2010 to help manage the firewall on all of our, on, on all of our machines. Um, we have 160,000 machines spanning 2,600 data centers in roughly 107 countries. Um, so prior to Force Field, we had a lot of teams kind of managing the firewall in an ad hoc manner. There was really no way to see what the policy was for a given machine type that we had deployed. Um, so that was one of the first goals of Force Field was to create a centralized place where we could view and manage the policies for all of our machines. <coughs> um, as a firewall, it is our first line of defense against attacks. And kind of the, the usability goals that we had were for it to be to safely expose all the net filter functionality to other teams so that applications could write um, IP tables rules, net filter rules, have all the functionality available to them. Um, but we wanted to do it in a safe way, a way that we could monitor it, report on it, and make sure everything was running as we expected. Um, and then we also provided some easy to use abstractions for developers to use that covered most of the common use cases <clears throat> so that they didn't have to be an IP tables expert to say open a port on a machine. So this diagram at the bottom kind of uh, depicts our stack or our model that we work with. So we have three, or force field exposes three APIs. We have an installation API, so if you think of Chef or Puppet, um, this would be like an API that we expose at that layer to where people can register rules or open ports. We have a runtime API where people can add rules, modify things at runtime. Then we also have a metadata API, and when I say metadata, that's probably an Akamai specific term, um, but this is an API where operators can go through a web UI to update configuration information for machines. Part of that configuration information is for IP tables and IP sets through force field. Um, and again, this is, this is just going to be a brief overview of how we use NetFilter and force field um, so that whenever Josh gets up and talks about some of the stuff that we want to see in IP set and IP tables that you guys have an, an idea of how we use it and where we're coming from. Okay, so for our install API, like I mentioned, we can open closed ports. We also have a a way to um, a policy called protect this port. And what this means is basically uh, a source IP ACL will be applied to that port. And we're currently using the HashNet IP set type and we have roughly 460,000 entries in there that cover all of our Akamai machine IPs. Um, and so that's part of, that's, those are the easy abstractions that Force Field provides for users. They can also install 
application specific rules in IP sets. Some of the popular use cases that we see are white and blacklist. Um, we also see rate limiting, so a lot of people like to rate limit the amount of information or the number of requests going to a certain API, so they will offload that to NetFilter when possible. Um, we also probably like a lot of other people use it for attack sign or we put attack signatures into our rules. So any common attack signatures that we have, we put into rules. And then lastly, there's a, um, a use case around random sampling. So a lot of people like to log, um, whether it be drop packets or a certain sort, a certain set of packets, but they don't want to have all the packets coming up to user space. So then they will use a random sampling to get packets to user space where they'll then log a certain set of the packets that they're interested in. And this code snippet out at the bottom is an example of our installation API. So this is setting a protection, opening port 80 and 443 on machines that we, on the machine type, um, our global host or ghost for short. So that's our install API. For the runtime side, we allow applications to dynamically modify the contents of IP sets. Um, so this is how they can add IPs to an IP set dynamically at runtime. Um, they also use this to toggle IP tables rules. So what we found is it's really easy at install time to put all of your rules into IP tables. So you establish what we call a playbook, and then later on, whenever you want to, say your machine is under attack or um, you want to enable your rule set, you can toggle an IP set. So an example of this would be an IP tables rule that matches on, say, a whitelist toggle set with a destination IP and it jumps to the chain filter. And so this, this can be done at install time, but then later on during the runtime, if the machine comes under heavy load, the application can go ahead and add that machine's IP to the, to the whitelist toggle set, and now the, to the, the filtering that they wanted to do for the attack is in place. Um, so this alleviates always processing all the chains and taking the performance hit and in this case, we only take the performance hit when we detect that we're under attack. Um, so the last API that I talked about is the metadata interface. And this allows operators to push changes out to a set of machines. So they can say, all these machines, I want to add this rule to it. And it's a quick and safe way for us to react to any sort of attack we're seeing on the network. Um, we try to have around five minute timeline to get this data out. So by the time the operator pushes the button to send this out, roughly five minutes, it will have propagated to all 160,000 machines. Um, so the last bit on force field is it's monitoring. Um, as any service that we run on our network, we want to be able to monitor it in a, in a kind of centralized way so that we know it's operating the way we think it should. Some of the things that we're interested in from the NetFilter side is, are the chains and IP sets that we've configured, are they actually loaded? Um, and then we want to also get the counter type of information back from these components so that we can detect if things are abnormally high. Is there indication that there might be a, a misconfiguration on the network? or just for reporting. So, some, some of this gets tied back to some of our products where we can tell our customers, yes, we've dropped this many packets on your behalf and such. <clears throat> um, part of the monitoring is also our traffic analysis. Our InfoSec team and security team like to have access to all the packets we've dropped so that they can analyze them. Um, so we implemented this feature within Forest Field where Using it, the NF log utilities, we log a sampling of packets that we've dropped. Um, initially, we were doing some deep packet inspection on the machines themselves, but we found that to be um, to be a security vulnerability whenever we were, the libraries we were using to parse the packets weren't exactly safe. So now we just log the actual packet payload itself, and we combine that in a message frame that has error correction codes these logs then get aggregated using our infrastructure into a centralized place where we have some analysis tools that um, analyze these packets to see exactly what's going on on our network. Um, an example of what that dashboard looks like is here where we can 
show the breakdown of packets that we've dropped based on where they're coming from, the source country, um, the target country, as well as the protocols and ports that are being targeted. Um, <clears throat> so this sort of heat map has been used to, if there's a specific application that you're writing and it's using a protocol um, and things aren't working or you're seeing a performance decrease, some people have come into here to see, oh, there's a hot spot in this one region of the world, maybe something's misconfigured there, maybe it's lagging behind in its configuration. <clears throat> okay, so I talked about how we've integrated with NetFilter. Some of the pain points during this process um, of distributing our policies across all of our machines in an automated way has come from the textual CLI that these tools support. Um, so an example of one of the problems that we've ran into is whenever you create something in IP set, what you create and then what you read back from IP set may not always be the same. And in this example that I have up here, the, the underlying part has been added. So I do an IP set create and then I save that same set, which is the read operation in IP set. And I get back something that looks different. And when dealing with this in an automated fashion, yes, we could parse this and realize it's the same, but it was a stumbling block initially that you know, this does look different. This isn't exactly what I put in. Did it really load correctly? So that's one of the things. Um, there's also teams that want to change the IP sets and IP tables rules at a fairly frequent pace. So shelling out to these components um, is a performance uh, consideration for them. Uh, <coughs> one workaround for that, if, if, of course, is batching the operations together, but that requires a little bit more thought on our side or a little bit more logic on the user space side. <clears throat> Another um, interesting point that we ran into was the non-atomic IP set operations that IP set currently supports. So right now if you, if you restore a script that has multiple operations in it, um, if there's a problem halfway through it, um, half of those operations will be committed to the IP set and you'll be left in an inconsistent state or maybe something you don't expect. Um, so our workaround currently for that is to create a temporary set, copy the existing set to the temporary set, perform our operations on the temporary set, and if everything went well, swap that temporary set back to the target set. Um, of course, if there's a failure, then we can delete the temporary set and never swap back to the target set, and the target set is left unharmed. One of the disadvantages of this current approach is that we lose counter information during this swap. So I think it was mentioned also, or also talked about last night at the NF tables tutorial about losing counter information during these swapping operations. Um, another feature that we'd like to see is the ability to um, notice when changes are being made to IP tables and IP sets so that we can react accordingly. So with that said, a short list of if we were to develop an API, a program, programmatic API that applications can use to sort of monitor and manage IP tables and IP set, we would like to create an API that has the normal create, read, update, delete operations. Um, we're seeing this come along in NF tables, obviously, but the whenever you create something, you would get a handle to it and perform these operations using that handle. The, the messages exchanged could be extensible um, with a well-defined field layout, which I think we're getting there. And then lastly, a, a way to register callbacks or provide some asynchronous method for getting updates about what is changing within IP tables or IP set. Okay, so with that, we've kind of started at the top with our application layer, how we integrate with NF filters. Um, Josh is going to go <coughs> ahead and talk about some of the internals of IP sets and IP tables that he's been working on to help scale to our needs. So yeah, um, so Pete's kind of covered, like you said, the, the high level overview of what, what we've been doing with IP tables. Um, and you know, a lot of those issues revolve around lack of uh, a fully supported library there. Uh, and for the most part, we're able to to leverage IP tables as is, uh, we haven't really had to do too many modifications to, to IP tables. Um, 
basically leveraging you know the, the great work that the community has already done. Uh, recently, though, we have hit some problems with uh, hash limit matching, uh, and so this is kind of a description of the problem, uh, one of the problems. So uh, right now, there's an issue where if we modify hash parameters uh, through IP tables restore uh, with the same uh, uh, table name, uh, the configuration parameters don't don't change. So the example here is, uh, you know, the original rule had a, a rate limit up to 10 packets per second. Uh, we've changed it in the new rule during a restore to 1,000 per second. Uh, this actually doesn't change any of the configure underlying configuration for, for that match. Um, and so I had proposed a, a change earlier this year, but apparently, um, let me go to the next slide. I'll step back. So you know, the problem is that the, uh, the internal function there only checks against the name and the family to see if it already exists, and if it does, it doesn't do anything to, to change the, uh, the configuration. Um, the upstream, the, the change that I kind of proposed was to, to check against all of the uh, configuration parameters for the table, or for the match, and, uh, and then if it doesn't match, create a new one. Apparently, though, uh, there was some concern if, uh, there was already some existing, well, this was ex existing functionality and this might break uh, some people's expectations of how uh, hash limit currently operates. Um, there's also a secondary problem uh, along the same, same lines is if you have even the same rule set, if you're referencing the same uh, hash limit table with different config parameters, it just silently allows you to do this. But actually, uh, and in the example here, uh, the second rule actually still uses the same configuration as the first rule. So there's no, no warning or, or error out, um, in this condition. Um, and so I guess th the question here is, you know, it, is this something, uh, either can we change in the current uh, hash limit or is this something that would need a, a, a new implementation? Um, so I guess that's kind of a question for, for the, uh, the group here. Um, and then uh, another problem we've run into recently is there's a, uh, the maximum rate of uh, rate limit right now is hard coded to 10,000 packets per second. I think this is due to a couple of things, but I, if I remember correctly, there is a expectation that the smallest frequency uh, allows, I think, a, or a match against like a one, one event per day, and then also be able to support up to, uh, you know, 10,000 packets per second. Um, I'm wondering if we could extend this. It appears that it might be based, uh, or the, the limitation here is because if it's a 32-bit uh, data type, and we might be able to extend that to support a higher level of packets per second. We're getting requests from teams to be able to do uh, matching on, you know, like DNS servers and things where, uh, 10,000 packets per second isn't, it, it, that thrush, threshold for us is too low. Um, and so the, 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 I think we would like to go ahead and, and raise this, this limit uh, either in uh, the existing hash limit or in, um, in a new implementation, uh, assuming that the first problem that I talked about is, is something that we can't resolve now. So I don't know, is there any, Pablo, or I don't know if anybody. Yeah, oh, sorry. Yeah, the point is that. Uh, okay, now. So, yes, the, the problem is that we, I mean, um, the policy has been so far that, that we didn't accept this kind of uh, second versions of existing matches and targets. I mean, the, we, we had in the past uh, patches to get quota two and similar things. What, what we have currently is a revision, revision, uh, revision infrastructure that allows us to introduce um, uh, updates to, to extensions. The point in there is that um, we should do it in, in a backward compatible fashion. So sure. probably, probably introducing a new parameter well, get another parameter to, to hash name it. It, it. it already has quite a lot of them. Yeah. But introduces a new parameter, so the new revision knows that you want the new behavior. 
and you want to use 62 big 62 big um, variable to store the rate and all the things that you need. So I think I would go that probably that way. Patrick, do you have some comment on that? Um, yeah, my main question is um, the behavior you mentioned about the different param param parameters you use and uh, what would the behavior be you expect if you uh, use the same table in two places and uh, supply different sets of uh, parameters? So like you're talking about in this case here where we've used the same table in the same rule set? Yeah, twice? I mean, I think it relates to the restoring problem. Yeah, I, I think, think it's all, yeah. Um, I, in my mind, it would error out of this case, right? It shouldn't allow this type of configuration. So just reject it. Yeah. Yeah, I guess that would be fine, but you would obviously have to specify that this behavior, the rejection is wanted. Right, right, sure. Yeah. Okay. Did you have a question too? Sorry. Yeah. You need the mic, Pablo. Uh, the first two problems you described, I suspect that that's a problem for a lot of people. Uh, and I do not really know if we made an attempt to understand. I do not know if we made an attempt to understand if uh, anybody would be adversely affected. Uh, yeah. But I guess from a project perspective, I understand the concern. We don't want to break the backward compatibility in case there is somebody out there. Uh, but we are a user of hash limits, and we ran into the same problems. OK, yeah. Uh, and we had to work. Uh, do something about it. Okay, yeah. I yeah, think, I I think um, the best way, if you would find, I mean, the algorithm um, seems to have a problem um, to express this kind of um, different rate limits for the same um, state it keeps. <coughs> I guess it should be possible to maintain the state in a fashion that you can apply different limits against the same state. So if you would find a uh, solution to that, it would be m the most preferable um, way, I think. Okay, sure. Yeah, we can look into that. So just to clarify, you, same table name, different rate specifications for yeah, music. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Should be possible, I think. OK. All right. Cool. Uh, let's see. So that was pretty much all that I had to talk about with, uh, sorry, for IP tables right now. Um, we really spend more of our time in the IP set code, um, especially uh, recently we've gotten a lot of internal requests to use more IP sets for things. Uh, as Pete mentioned, uh, through force field, you know, we have that um, the ACL where it, there's about 460,000 entries. We also have other teams where I think they've got sets in the order of, uh, you know, 2 million entries with a possibility of going up to 25 million in the next couple of years, um, or maybe even sooner. Uh, I think a lot of that though can, uh, at least for this particular use case that I'm, I'm thinking of, um, the 25 million issue is more, uh, the set is generally of like an IP port match uh, type set and you've got multiple entries for the same IP with different ports. So if we could somehow do, uh, you know, an interval or match against multiple ports for the same IP for the same entry, I think that would drop, drop this down considerably. Um, for, for, for this particular case. Um, the type of sets that we're using, I think Pete mentioned HashNet, you know, we're covering just about, this isn't everything that's supported, but uh, and I didn't list everything that we're using here, but this, there's a lot of different uh, uh, hash types being used at Akamai. Um, and we've got, like I said, a lot of internal teams uh, have been coming to us looking to use IP sets and it seems like they keep requesting yeah, the need f to, to block larger and larger numbers of uh, IPs and entries. Uh, they generally are using this for white and black listing. Um, and so we kind of have two, two ways of, of working on this. Uh, Akamai, uh, you know, Pete's team has you know, the, the firewall management layer, but there's some teams where this just doesn't, it's, it's not, it doesn't fit their needs right now. And so they're just relying on uh, lib IP set. And so, um, I, we, we understand that it's not a kind of a fully supported or stable API, but it, it's what's available right now, and uh, we haven't had the time to, to kind of extend it. Um, 
so I think we're willing to kind of take those risks and then just handle the problems internally. And also, if we, if we have any issues there, I mean, we, we definitely try to push whatever we can back. Um, the, the problems with LibIV set, though, is it doesn't really export or expose everything that we'd like to see with respect to uh, set metadata. And so uh, we've recently started trying to push out a few patches there to, to extend and uh, expose some, uh, some of the set information. For example, like set size info isn't something that's displayed in the IP set header right now. So we have teams relying on actually counting entries uh, to, to, to check the actual set size, see how many elements are present. Um, so it's just things like this where uh, they're just not um, available right now. And so I, I, with all the requests for uh, you know, support for or the need for IP sets from other, other teams, uh, they also want this visibility into the, the sets and to be able to, to configure them as they want and also to, to monitor that information. So, and another big problem with libIP set is it's not thread safe. So um, just to kind of look at, this isn't performance data that probably most people care about, but uh, um, just looking at the overhead of just adding entries to sets. Uh, so if we try to add, uh, entry, like a million entries, uh, random IPs to a, a, uh, a basic uh, hash IP uh, set here. Uh, it takes on the order of a little over five minutes, um, which isn't really doable. <laughs> That's not usable. So we've, and as kind of Pete talked about earlier, the way that we add entries to sets is through restore. Uh, and so the restore method, you can see we can restore a set of a million entries in approximately two seconds here. Uh, and then the time to save them is a little less than a second. So these are the these are the operations that we're kind of we're using right now to update set information. Uh, that it, basically because of the scale that we're having to deal out with. Um, Pete alluded to a lot of these earlier, but you know these operations aren't atomic. Uh, so you fail your midway gets us a partial set, which isn't usable usually. Uh, you don't know what state you're in. Uh, also, the sets currently grow, but they don't shrink. So uh, we can resize up, but we never reclaim that memory um, on the way back down. And the separation between IP set and IP tables makes it difficult to work with. Uh, you know, from a kind of a middle layer level, you, you have to kind of manage both and double checking that, okay, when I put the set in, you know, it actually completed and, you know, then I can update the rule. So uh, we wanted to take a look at NF tables because we're pretty interested in, in that and wanted to see, uh, you know, just kind of, you know, how it is uh, compared to, to IP set. And so uh, I did some basic tests with, with NF table sets to, uh, to kind of understand uh, how it is on par with just the, the simple, uh, you know, creation and deletion uh, test that I had just shown. So, we took uh, the current net next and tried adding a million entries to to uh, an NFT set. This is um, a uh, type IPv4 address set. And uh, it took a really long time. So I decided just to scale it back to 10,000 entries. And I got around about uh, three, three and a half minutes. And so uh, with IP set, I can do 10,000 entries in about 20 seconds, which still isn't really usable for us, but it just kind of gives you a, a, a data point there. Um, and so, like I said before, we've seen this problem with IP sets, so the next logical step was, okay, well, let's try restores. How do, how do we do with restores there? So we tried to do a restore of 10,000 entries, and it's less than a second. So it was like, all right, there we go. That's, that's our route. So. <laughs> Then uh, trying to do uh, a restore of a million, we hit a problem. Uh, so the system kind of started soft lock upping on us. Uh, so I reported this upstream. I think uh, there's the link here for the, uh, the thread. Uh, Kong replied back with a patch to insert a Conry sketch in the uh, new set element function. That appears to get rid of the soft lockup, but there's still some other underlying issues there. Um, so looking into it in a little more detail, right now there seems to be a problem with uh, when we do set restores, the hash table isn't growing properly. So we've got 
we start off, I think, NFT hash sets uses initial set of uh, size of four buckets. And uh, when we go ahead and we try to do a restore here of 10,000 elements, uh, it doesn't do the expansion until after the restore is complete. So why doesn't it grow on restore? Uh, so I'm not sure yet. <laughs> it's on my to-do list. But I think after t talking with uh, Patrick yesterday, and I think he mentioned that he spoke with Thomas about it, that maybe they have a good idea of what's going on here. I don't know. Did you guys have anything to add at this point? Or yeah, I think um, well, some recent uh, changes to our hash table broke um, the grow decision, um, so it basically doesn't decide to grow. I think that should be it. I'm not 100% um, sure. Um, maybe Thomas has looked into it already. The question would be: Have you tested with the fix that was posted, or without the fix? Uh, which fix? Uh, fix was posted by. Yeah, you, you, both are, yeah. you posted one fix mm -hmm. that, like the grow, the grow decision was broken. And oh yeah, only, yeah. So that happen. that's on. Yeah. Okay. Sorry. Yes. So this is. Uh, yeah, I'm getting to that. So maybe it's a little out of order. So with the grow decision fix, it still has a problem growing. So th this was. Uh, this was yeah with that patch. The one thing that we discussed is that. In the case of NFT hash, um, growing from from a, from four buckets to sure. one million yeah. takes a lot of expansion cycles. So and I, we, I talked to uh, Patrick about that. Maybe we can grow quicker than just by a factor of two but by one by do one expansion. Do we know cycle. why it's not even kicking in at all during? Well, that's definitely a bug. Right? Yeah. That, uh, that's definitely a bug that we need to fix. But I think even beyond that, right. when you grow from four buckets to one million to maybe five hundred thousand buckets, sure. Um, the expansion will take a while, and in the meantime, a lot of inserts will happen. Yeah, yeah. That will create long chain length. That will, will make the expand take e even longer. I think we'll have that address. After we fix the expansion problem in general, we ha we'll have to address that as well. Okay. Well, that makes sense. Yeah, I mean, it's, um, I'm not quite sure what's happening there. Uh, a couple of questions regarding the, um, let's start with the insertion times. Um, the, when you added the one million entries, did you make one million invocations of NF tables, or did you add multiple entries uh, in one invocation, or how did you exactly add them? So uh, when I, so I should have clarified this earlier. Uh, when I talk about ads, I'm doing an NFT ad. When I'm talking about restores, I'm restoring it from a rule set file. Yeah. So what I did was I generated the million random IPs, and then I populated that into a rule set. And then I did NFT minus F to restore that, right? Okay, and so the one million ads was one million uh, invocations of the NF tables binaries um, and adding one element each time. In the ad case, yes. Yeah, okay, uh, sure, that's, I guess, expected. Yeah, yeah, so that, well. and I have a little, so in a couple more slides, I go into batching and things like that, <coughs> which seems to resolve some of those mm -hmm. issues. Okay, yeah, and regarding the expansion stuff, um, we talked about that and, um, it's not quite clear yet what to do, but it's clear that there is some problem which, which needs to be solved. And um, I guess okay. we'll talk about that some more and come up with something. Yeah, sure. So uh, yeah, I'll get to that patch with the expansion problem in just a second. Um, so I, I wanted to understand you know, the underlining for our hash tables if we start at four buckets and if we did an ad, so an NFT ad, and we did that at one element at a time, how, how large did the table grow to? And so it gets to 16,000 elements there. Um, and so what happens if I do a restore now and I, have, and I provide it with a hint, a, of a, a large enough hint at the beginning to say, I'm going to start with a million buckets, right? And if I do a restore there, then I get it down to 1.3 seconds to load a million entries. And so IP sets on about two seconds, so we're, you know, now we're on par with IP set restore. Oh, yeah, yeah, exactly, yeah, yeah, so. Sorry. No, I was just um, indicating that, that in NF tables, we, we, we have transactional support, so we are also solving the problem that you exactly. have with yes. unrolling in case that we have problem adding an an element, so. So better and faster, yeah. Yes, I, yeah. that's quite surprising, I didn't know that. So here goes, this goes into a little more uh, detail of what Thomas was talking about. So uh, the first problem that I hit was that we couldn't actually expand the hash table. So the underlying data structure for the hash table in NFT 
sets is using our hash tables. Uh, and so as of like a week ago, the net, net, net next implementation for NFT hash set, well, that this still is true, I guess, but it defaults to four buckets. Um, but it doesn't define a max shift value, uh, parameter to our hash tables. And if that's not defined, then we can't grow, right? And so uh, there's a check effectively in our hash tables that if max shift isn't defined, we don't, we're not allowed to, to, to grow the, the hash at that point. So um, basically I pushed a patch to say, you know, in our hash tables that if, uh, yeah, to resolve basically this problem that if you don't provide a max shift parameter and you're trying to, um, but you have defined a grow decision function, that it it won't allow you to do so. So that's what this this link uh, links to that patch. And I think we basically agreed that that was a, a valid case. Daniel had some changes, but I think that one will be easy to do. Um, the other problem though is that right now NFT set. Uh, or NFT sets or NFT set hashes has no way to really set an initial number of buckets. So I know you have some thoughts on this, but um, yeah, go I ahead. might interrupt. <clears throat> we used to have this way, and it seems it fell victim to the R hash table conversion okay. as well. So um, yeah. we need to restore that. All right. Yeah, yeah. So right now there's a size parameter for NFT sets, and it's kind of used in two places. So it's right now, or Currently in that next, it's populating the uh, in LM hint for our hash tables, which is supposed to state how many initial buckets you want to allocate for that table. But it's also being used as the ceiling on how high the table is in, in NFT sets is being used as the ceiling on how high the set can grow. So these two really don't overlap. And so um, basically this this seemed incorrect, and so I proposed kind of two patches here. Uh, one is to use the size parameter to define max shift for NFT hash sets so that it's consistent with the other NFT uh, code, and I defaulted it to, if you don't define a size parameter in the rule set, I defaulted it to a thousand elements. I don't know, that was just arbitrary number that seemed <coughs> reasonable at the time. Um, so there's a link to that patch. And then also to introduce a new parameter of, which I just called a knit size, which probably isn't the greatest, but uh, to effectively plug into the NLM uh, hint, which would then be passed to our hash table. So that's, those are the two. And with those in place, then we kind of start seeing some better, better results. Um, so again, if I, if I do single ads here, we still see some some slowdowns, uh, or not slowdowns, but it's just, it's slow. Uh, these are single invocations of NFT add element. Uh, so in this case, it's 10,000. Uh, it still takes about three minutes. Um, but if I do a restore, and this also, I'll, I'll back up, I gave an initial size hint here of 16,000 so that the hash table didn't have to grow uh, throughout the, the, the ad operations. Um, the other the other data here is I uh, did a restore of 10,000 elements. We're pretty fast there. Um, and then a restore of a million elements using two million initial buckets, which I think if I did an ad, that's about what it would, what our hash tables would probably uh, set the bucket sizes to. So, and that's about 1.6 seconds, uh, which is, you know, that's reasonable. Um, so revisiting ads, so we still kind of have a problem with just the, the single ad case uh, here. I don't, you know, why do they take so long? Is there anything that we can do about it? Um, so the new patches add, you know, the number of initial buckets, uh, at least the ability to, to populate that. And so even doing that doesn't seem to affect the, the performance noticeably, at least in the single ad case. I'll get to batching in a second. Um, so. Why do they take so long still? I, again, it's something that I, I wanna look into. Um, is it just the system call overhead of calling this a million times? Um, I, and so what are the alternatives here? Uh, NFT does support batching, and so we can add multiple elements uh, in a single instance, right? And so if I try to batch add uh, a million entries, but I do it in chunks of 
2K or 4K, uh, then we're able to get down to here we see 14 to 12 seconds. Um, and in this particular case, though, I did provide a bucket hint at the beginning of the, when I created the set of a million entries. Uh, if I don't do that, we still see problems. So if I don't provide the hint there, if we start with four buckets, we still can't grow. So there's still the issue that Thomas was mentioning earlier. I think, uh, did, you, did you actually change min, uh, the, the minimum shift parameter as well? I noticed yesterday that if the min minimum shift parameter is below your, your uh, an elements hint, uh -huh. you, when you're adding, you will actually start shrinking because the number of elements is below. <laughs> Okay. So yeah. that, that needs to be fixed either by providing a like a, a patch that min shift is always um, at least, at least. elements hints. Yeah. Otherwise, you will you will start shrinking right away when you. Yeah, start I definitely shift. saw that. I didn't notice it in this case, but I definitely saw that if you provide too large of a hint and you're not using it, our hash tables will start shrinking basically immediately. Um, but no, I didn't update the min shift here, so that's definitely something to try on that. So did you have a? Yeah. I think um, that's an interesting question because the hint, NFTAB is used to have this hint and it was meant if you specify a size in user space, it was meant um, that you're actually intending to use that. So we should only invoke the shrink, de uh, shrink decision. If you're deleting elements, not by adding elements, I mean, currently uh, the R hash table implementation checks both um, whenever you change anything. So it will shrink even if you add something, which probably doesn't make too much sense. Um, we can remove that, I think. And um, it might also make sense to just say, I don't want to go below, just have a min shift like you suggested. OK, cool. So what's sorry, sorry yeah, why, go ahead. why do you want, why are you batching um, those million entries in different, uh, why, why are you placing, why are you um, placing those, those updates in different batches, I mean, in, in a small batches? Right, so uh, I wanted to see if I could take advantage of the netlink messages, right? And yeah. so... No, but that is not, I mean, NF tables internally, what it happens is that every time that you send a patch, yep. um, at the end, I mean, it's going to, it's a two-phase commit protocol. So right, but if you see here that the time actually starts getting worse as I get larger batch sizes, if I did a million entries all at once, it's still, it's going to be like three minutes again That's or whatever it is. That is interesting. Yeah. Um, but anyway, I mean, that, that, that will result in several calls of synchronized RCU in a row. And, sure, yeah, yeah, yeah. And yeah. That's, that's usually very bad, so. Yeah, no, there's definitely something here with that, and it's probably tied to why adding a million single entries takes a long time. So there's def more investigation needs to be done yeah. into this, yes. Um, so I think this is just a summary slide. Uh, so 4,000 entries took about 12 seconds. Single element takes many min minutes. Um, so the batching allows you to combine multiple entries into a single uh, netlink message, and I guess you know reduce the the syscall overhead there. Um, so here's kind of a, a, a summary of where things were when I last left them. Um, you know, IP set add of a single element a million times or you know a million entries takes about five five and a half minutes. Um, a restore though is about two seconds. Uh, Single adds of a million entries, so NFT add uh, takes a long time. Um, if I am I batch that though, I can get it down to 12 seconds, and there's still probably uh, you know a way to get that maybe even further down. Um, and then the restore, I can get that to with the patches uh, to 1.6 seconds, and so it's on par with uh, and as Pablo pointed out, better than than IP set, because we have the atomic, atomicity stuff. Um, so yeah, so this is just basically kind of our initial impressions of what we played around with with NF table sets. Uh, you know, with the patches, everything, the performance for restore definitely seems accept, accept, acceptable. Uh, the atomicity is definitely a big win for us. I know that's a big problem for Pete's team. Um, the ability to combine V4 and V6 rule sets uh, will reduce duplicate code for us. Is there a way to combine V4 and V6 entries in the same set? Um, oh, you can't do that. Okay. Um, the, you have to specify the type, and it's go going to be either V4 or V6. V4 or V6, great. Uh, this isn't exactly set related, but this is NF tables related. Um, 
you guys mentioned last night that the INET table type or whatever, there was a restriction on that. Can, do you, can you repeat what the... It changed, the, the, INET, the INET chain type. Yeah, the restrictions. I mean, there are no real restrictions. Um, we don't have NAT, I think, for um, the INET table so far, uh, for the INET family. And we don't have um, the route uh, chain property, so no automatic rerouting after packet remarking. Yeah, only filtering, basically. It's basically only filtering what is supported currently. Okay. If you, NAT would be easy to add. I mean, if you need it, we can add it. It's not yeah, a problem. Yeah. But so we'd be able to combine v4 and v6 rule sets into a single rule set at this point, right? Yeah, right. Yeah. Okay, that's what I thought. You can yeah, also, yeah. Um, you can also, it's built in a way that allows you to, um, well, basically do what you would expect. You can specify rules which will apply to both families. Like if you use just TCP dport 22, for instance, it will apply to both uh, v4 and v6 packets, this uh, rule. And right, yeah, that's cool, okay. Yeah, and regarding having, having uh, sets with IPv4 and IPv6 uh, addresses, um, the main problem is that we have the, the payload um, expression. Basically, it receives a base, offset, and length. And in, in the INET, in the INET family, we will need some kind of something similar to what we did with the rejects and mapping. So we can specify not based on on base offset, but based on attack that says. I want to match destination address, IP a destination address, and then... Well, no, it's two different problems. I mean, the one thing is loading the address from the packet. Um, this can, well, we load the... We do it what, like we do before. We load four bytes for v4 and uh, 16 bytes for v6. The problem is um, representation and comparability in the set. Um, you will, I mean, it's just bit strings. You will need some mapping to um, basically make sure a v4 address isn't um, interpreted as a some kind of v6 address, which is just mapped. So um, it's not about loading it from the packet. I mean, you load it like always. Um, but it's about having this uh, different data types in the set and making sure they're not mixed up while comparing. We most likely can do it in some way, but um, so far it hasn't been high on the priority list. Okay. Uh, the next point is something that I talked to Patrick about last night. So I wasn't able to get a set to choose RB tree, but it seems like it requires the intervals. Is that... Yeah, the RB tree, I mean, it's a quite inefficient uh, set implementation. It is mainly, it exists because um, for testing interval-based sets, and um, which you obviously can't do with hash tables, um, so the RB tree is basically the most, um, was the easiest way to have an implementation which actually supports that. So as soon as you start using intervals, the RB tree will be automatically chosen. Okay. Because of its uh, high memory requirements, it is not chosen automatically for any different uh, setup. Sure. And so I, one of the questions that we had going into you know, the underlying supported uh, data structures there is, well, I guess two things. One is what are the thoughts on being able to provide a hint or to be able to force something to take a particular set type? Why would you use that. I mean, basically this means that our selection process would be broken because we promised to select something um, yeah. reasonable for you. Okay. I mean, you actually can do that. You can load um, what is happening in the kernel. It just as a, um, it loads all modules which alias to right, empty yep. set. And once this has happened, um, you can unload the modules you don't want. Like if you unload uh, NFT hash, um, it won't try to load modules again because one module providing NFT hash is present, which would be RB tree. Yep. At that point, it will always choose RB tree. I definitely RB3. saw that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, the other question that we had was, you know, and I, you alluded to this last night, and it's probably in your slides later, but are open to adding other, I mean, the hooks are definitely there to provide other data structures to be used instead of a hash or RB tree or whatever. Absolutely. I think we're interested in looking at alternatives there, so. Yeah, sure, I mentioned I have, um, an, it's called array map try, um, queued up for years now. Um, it's almost finished for years now. Um, I'm gonna submit it at some point, but we are open to adding, well, this is why we have this um, infrastructure. We would like to have lots sure. of different implementations. Yeah, yeah. I think we'd be interested in testing that. So. Okay, just just a comment on the use of, or how the. I don't think the mic's on. Just. Yeah. All right, test. Uh, just a comment on how the hash type is selected. Um, I think our users are really interested in knowing exactly which type is going to be selected. So if they could say beforehand, I want to explicitly use this type, they'd be happy. Yeah. So that it's, they know. 
Well, why? Um, I'm interested in understanding um, why you would be interested in having one particular implementation um, if um, from the user point of view it basically makes no difference. And we promise to um, select, based on the policy you specify, memory performance usage, um, we promise to select the one which is optimal for your data. Uh, I just, from the engineers that we work with, uh, <laughs> they will want to know exactly what it is and have full control uh, so that yeah. something's not swapped out between releases or something like that. Right, so I guess you could think of an example where maybe we implement something new in the next kernel and that gets chosen now for this particular set type, but and it's maybe not something that they were expecting or that they've fully tested because they were assuming, you know, they're making assumptions based that we would still be choosing a hash type, not the array try or whatever. Yeah, I see. Um, I mean, basically what you can do is um, load the modules manually or blacklist modules, which is basically one uh, way to choose it. We don't have a way to express it in the API. Um, this also there is some reason for that. Um, we wanted to have the freedom to remove set implementations from the kernel, okay. replace them, and basically have the kernel make the selection without any exposure to user space. So when we add something new, which we think is better than the exist previous implementation, um, so it will automatically use it without any changes to user space. And once we start exposing that stuff, we are limited to changing behavior, um, removing implementations, uh, etc. So um, I would prefer to um, stick to um, dealing with modules for um, choosing choosing, uh, which choosing instead of uh, exposing it in the API. Okay. Uh, well, I, that, that, that is still leave, um, don't don't allow don't allow people to select to to parameterize. I mean, we are supposed to provide a, a very good um, solution, but well, I, I I'm I kind of always shaking the feeling that at some point we will we will have to to provide so detailed, so I, I guess most people will just use performance or memory, just the policy, but I mean, and for example, the problem that that um, Josh had, and the, the attribute that he needed to add is, is not overlapping actually, right? With, with Yeah, I don't know if it overlaps with any other set types. I mean, types. You, you are specifying the, num the number of buckets and the size attribute that we have indicates the maximum number of elements, right? Well, it was actually, it was meant as a hint. Um, the hint is enforced um, as a maximum also. You specify the maximum, but it's, it is expected to be actually used. So it uh, used to be used to actually allocate, in the hash table case, a set of that amount uh, of that size. It's also enforced as a maximum just in case um, there might be set implementations in the future uh, which you where you have to know the size from the beginning. So. Um, because the kernel automatically chooses this transparently, the user doesn't notice. I didn't want to get into a situation where the kernel might choose an implementation which really has hard limits uh, on, on this hint and other stones, so you get um, inconsistent behavior. So I chose to always enforce it as a maximum, even if not necessary. But it's meant to be as a hint. It was actually meant for exactly this purpose, and it's basically a bug that it's not working right now. Um, it okay. Was well but then would you, what would you use to set the ceiling on the size of the set? Or would you want to enforce that something through something else? Well, um, I would use the same value for both, actually. Um, I mean, it specifies the size. So I don't, know that you want, I don't know that you want to say, I have a set that I'd like to cap at 25 million entries, but I don't want to start the hash off at 25 yeah, sure, million whatever buckets. We could use because especially values. because it's going to start shrinking immediately. That's also something which it shouldn't do, um, I guess. Well, um, yeah. Yeah. So if we fix that, um, I mean, you're right. It might be reasonable to add two different uh, parameters for that. Because um, I think you, you lose something with our hash tables being able to shrink and expand as needed by forcing it to stay at. Okay, I'm going to need 25 million buckets at some point, so I'm going to go ahead and allocate those now. Yeah, and leave sure. There, the right? use case was actually a little bit different. It was meant for um, sets where the entire contents are known from the beginning, and user space can make this analysis. Um, we have these ma and this many elements, so we're going to um, get a hash table of exactly the size. Um, from right. The yeah. Beginning. Sure. But it's different, of course. We can add a hint basically um, for the initial size, and um, keep the current size specification as a cap. Okay. Uh, let's see, so, where are we here? Uh, uh, another thing that we kind of came across, and I think you guys talked about this yesterday, but wanted to clarify. Um, so I noticed that storing like 
really large sets in a single file becomes cumbersome because you've got, you have your rule set and then you have how many lines of a million entries and then maybe you have, say you have 20 sets that have a million entries each all stored in a single file. Uh, so you mentioned, I think, the possibility to do like includes and stuff like that with the rule set. Is that possible? You have an include statement. You can simply read in different files. Um, so you could move your set uh, definitions out to different files. Um, this will only work. You will have to have the entire set, um, either the commands or the entire set definition, including the elements in a second file. You basically, you can do an include in the middle of a statement to just read entries from a file um, which only contains, for instance, addresses and nothing else, no markups or whatever. Okay. Um, we could also add something like that, so you can just use a list, read it in, and treat it as single elements or something. If that that yeah. would help. So, I mean, can you reference? So instead of, so I know the rule, you reference the set with whatever, like, at set name or whatever it is. And then at the top of the, the rule file, if I could just say, you know, include the set name. Yeah, well basically, what it, what, it, what it does is you, you, you indicate include at the beginning of the file. Mm -hmm. And it, uh, that file is going to contain a table definition and the sets that you want to load in one file. So you, in one file, you maintain the All sets the set. you want to load. And on a, on a different file, you are going to have the, 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 the rules actually that are referencing to that, to that set that you want to use. So just just in case you want to maintain two different files, one is going likely one is not likely not going to change that contain the rule set, right? And the other file is, is the going, one to that is going to change that yeah. contains the rule the this the set elements, right? The the IP addresses. Okay, all right, we'll we'll play around with that then. Um, and I think you guys are going to talk about this later too. But just wondering the plans as far as NFT set implementation, if it's the plan is to reach the you know, kind of feature parity with IP sets in, you know, in respect to you know, set types and things along those lines? Well, um, feature-wise, of course, um, we want um, the dynamic updates, removals, timeouts. Basically, people have been asking for that, and I have patches queued. I'm going to talk about that later. Okay. Uh, regarding set types, um, I mean, NF tables is quite different from IP sets, so we are not going to add um, millions of different types based on the data which yeah, yeah, they sure. contain, of course. Yeah. But we are, as I was mentioning, we're quite interested in getting uh, different implementations, um, which are, I mean, there might be many possibilities to optimize for a specific key length for small or bigger set, uh, larger set contents and so on. We're quite interested in um, having many of these implementations which are optimized for specific cases. Okay, the, uh, so we have kind of the, the general types of v4 address, v6, you know, uh, ports and things like that. Is there is it supported right now to combine them into a single set, so have multiple types defined in a set, so you emulate like hash IP port or hash net net or something? Um, so you want to have multiple data types in one set, right? Yeah, well, yeah, so right now for, for like I said, examples, you know, hash IP port. I need to be yes, able to right. define a hash that that matches against this, the IP and the port number. Yeah, I have a feature queued up, which um, is we wanted to have this from the beginning. It took a while to get it ready, but um, basically it's ready. Um, it will be submitted for the next kernel version. It's called concatenations, where you can yep. simply concatenate different keys. Uh, you can say IP um, source address uh, dot um, TCP D port, for instance, and it will uh, concatenate those data values in the kernel. Okay. And your keys will also be concatenated in the set, so you can basically combine any kind of key. You can you create like. any type of yes. set type that you, or yeah, yes, it, it basically you can dynamically instantiate new types by um, specifying concatenations, and you can combine any kind of key you want. Okay, cool. Is there going to be? I mean, this is probably just an implement uh, user implementation, but like li the list set type is that going to be something that will be? Uh, I'm not sure what's it. What is it, uh, what is it doing? So right now, a list set is effectively, I think, a, a, a linked list of, of different sets, sets yeah. right? I have not considered that. Um, do you, what do you use this for? Uh, I know that we are using it. I don't remember the use case off the top of my head. Um, but I, I think, yeah, I'll, I'll have to check and get back to you. I don't know. If I mean, we could certainly add that. Um, I wouldn't want to add it on the top level um, because we would have to special case um, that stuff. Okay. So we might be able to add a set type which basically just dispatches stuff to um, multiple sets. Um, should be possible, I guess, if there's a valid use case. Okay. 
uh, let's see. Oh, and this kind of came up earlier too, but so the more, I think like Pete was saying, from our perspective, the more user configurable the sets and information is, kind of the, the more valuable it becomes for us, uh, whether it's control or whatever. Um, you know, even if it's only done at the library level, at the API level, and not exposed maybe through the command line utility, um, but the ability to do, uh, you know, setting, like we said earlier, the number of initial hash buckets, but maybe even setting grow and shrink thresholds, uh, things along those lines, so that you could specify, if you don't want the default of 7530 or whatever it is, we could specify something there and put a generic function in the kernel that kind yeah, of Yeah, I can that. see that it's useful, um, but I'm, I'm not so sure about exposing implementation specifics in the API because um, basically it's meant to um, choose an implementation which might not even have any notion of um, these yeah. limits. So um, I would prefer not to actually. Um, <laughs> if we can find some different way, um, I would prefer that. Okay. Uh, we'll I play around probably, with that some more though. Probably we can, yes. I mean, yes, allow users. I mean, provide both both ways to, the, the policy way that we have to, to indicate memory or performance or just allow also to to explicitly indicate what kind of set they want sure, to use. Sure, we can do that, but at that point we lose one part of the flexibility we have. We can't um, change uh, too much of the behavior. I mean, all that stuff becomes part of the API. The internal implementation becomes part of the API if we allow to specify these parameters, select the exact implementation behavior, and it was actually meant to exactly not do this. Um, this was done on purpose. Um, so I don't want to just, sure, we can do it, I know that, but um, I want at least to think about that a lot before doing that. Okay, let's wait for more use cases. Uh, this came up as part of one of the other patches to the discussion. It's our hash table related. I don't know that it exactly fits here, but um, we have this size value which sets the ceiling and the sets. And I think we've kind of decided that that's gonna stay to s keep the ceiling there. There was a question that I had asked uh, when I posted that max shift patch though, of whether the R hash table implementation should have some type of bounds on how many elements should be in the table at all. Because right now you guys are we're setting a max shift, which allows uh, bounds on the number of buckets that are created, but not necessarily the number of elements, so you can continue to grow you know, the chains as long as you have available memory. I don't know if that's a, a consideration. I, it, if it should be left up to, the, I think what was decided is it should be left up to the user to kind of force these type of uh, limits, but. Yeah, definitely, I mean, right, right now, like um, the other user is the Nutlink socket table, which enforces its own limit. And the right. uh, question is whether whether NFT wants to do that so inside our hash table, or whether we want to enforce that limit just in the in the NF set layer. I didn't really get that question. I think this mic is not really working anymore. So uh, the question is whether we want to enforce the, the limit inside our hash table, ma maximum number of entries, or inside the NF tables set. Code. Well, I don't really care. I mean, I, my comment on the mailing list was just about um, we are doing half of um, half of that stuff is done internally and the other half outside, so it's basically inconsistent. But I mean, I don't really care either way works. All right. Okay. <laughs> so, uh, so I mentioned a couple of to dos throughout, and basically I just ran out of time before we had to do the presentation, but uh, there's a bunch of things I still want to understand about NF tables, so we're going to continue to look into it uh, and play around with some things, especially after a lot of the things that came up today in the discussion. Um, you know, why the table doesn't grow during restore. Uh, there was, I wanted to do some other uh, performance comparisons as far as NF tables versus IP sets. Uh, there's some throughput and package per second information, so if, when I do that, I'll, I will send it to the mailing list. Um, you know, why single element ads take so long, and then also uh, I'd like to add some tests of the NF tables uh, test infrastructure to kind of exercise some of the cases that I, I talked about today so that we're kind of, you know, making sure that those are covered in, in the future versions. Um, I don't know if you guys didn't get to this yesterday, I don't think, but libNF tables is supposed to be the third-party library, right? Um, and so I, for us, 
in order to to build on that, I think that's really important to have a fully supported API that that we can take advantage of the you know net filter components. So actually, if I yep. if I might uh, interrupt, um, it's meant as a low layer uh, communication library. Um, the plan is to expose some higher layer functionality. Basically, um, what NF tables is doing the the binary the user space binary is doing internally. Um, we have um, the front end basically, which is uh, the Bison parser, and after that we have all the internal ev evaluation steps, which um, combine stuff, um, yeah. rearrange stuff, do pr type propagation, all that stuff, and that layer we actually want to expose in the library. Uh, we are not quite there yet because it's sure. still moving too much, um, but we will probably start at what some point in the maybe not too far future to start um, separating stuff into a library internally within uh, NF tables so we can try to get an API right, but uh, not export it so far and just try to um, well split up um, the NF tables binary in a library which will be exported um, also for users and um, at some point we will get going in this direction at some point um, release it as a separate project. Okay, yeah, that would be, we're definitely interested in, in helping out with that and testing it, so. Um, there is one thing, so when I tried to implement the init size parameter, one, I know, stumbling block, it, it was, there's a lot of places to update, it seems, if you want to add new functionality to user space. So you have to update the NF tables, utility, lib, NFT, NL, and then possibly lib, maybe lib NF tables, I don't know if, if that would need to be updated. And then also if it requires a kernel update, we're also having to update there. Uh, maybe this is just a price we have to pay for the way things are structured, but it does seem like you know updating the three or four places that wants to implement a single you know new parameter was a lot. Yeah, it has a lot of overhead. Um, if you actually need to add something new to the kernel, you have to well walk through all these layers and and uh, basically make the same simple adjustment in all of them. Um, right, it's right. Kind of annoying, but. Um, you in there are many cases on the upside. There are many cases where you actually don't need to update the kernel to implement some change, but can it do do it purely in the front end, which is um, the right. upside of that. But even in those cases, you still have to update these three components, right? Well, not necessarily. For instance, implementing a new match um, can usually be done well on on um, packet payload. For instance, can usually be done in the NF tables front end completely. You don't have to touch anything. Don't have to else touch any yeah. of the other. Okay. So it depends basically. It's gotcha. annoying, sure. Um, yeah, yeah, sure. Um, and then some of the requirements that we would have for libnf tables would be, you know, obviously thread safety uh, and the ability to kind of expose uh, what we'll call kernel level like rule or set metadata, some more information about the, the sets and things that we don't see right now in libip set that we're trying to expose. Um, the atomicity, which I think is already kind of covered <laughs> in the underlying infrastructure for NF tables, so that's not really a concern. And then, you know, I think Pete didn't see, we wanted to make sure that, you know, random matching, uh, they do a lot of statistical matching and things like that. And so that was a concern. That, I don't think that's maybe not part of live NF tables, but is it available uh, in NF tables right now? Is well, not real random. Um, yeah. We don't have, basically, we need something to provide random. I mean, you might be able to just use random packet data and declare this is random, but it's not real random. Um, we are missing that, so quite easy to implement. I mean, we can add it if you need it. Okay. Does that? Okay. Uh, we were also playing around with the NF tables compatibility tool. It was a really cool idea, um, but for us to be able to use it, although after after the discussion last night, it seems like maybe it it doesn't work for us. But if we were to use it, the right now there's no IP set functionality there, and so it kind of it, it breaks when we're going through. Yeah, I don't know if it's possible or if it's do. I mean, I'm sure it's possible, but whether it's 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 needed. We were thinking about doing it so that we could. Almost, you know, your 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 example of sim linking to the compat utility for this, we could sim link to an IP set compat layer. Um, the problem, though, I guess, is that, and we were hoping that it'd be a nice kind of shim layer, kind of drop in replacement while we're transitioning to full NF tables uh, and developing something on that. On that end, um, 
the problem though I think that was outlined last night is that if we do this one-to-one -one mapping from IP tables rule sets to NF tables that there's possibly going to be or expected performance issue with just taking the rules as they as they stand right now in IP tables right and so we would need to, we, I think we're planning on investigating it, but if that is the case, that may not be as much of a concern for us, at least, to be able to use something like that, right? I mean, if you were to dump your IP tables rules as NF tables rules and just, you know, and use that, that would be great, but it seems like there's a performance problem, or there's gonna be a performance hit, right? That's the expectation, at least, right? Yeah. So, I guess another possible just kind of thinking about all this is what about the ability to take your existing IP tables rules and make them more NF tables esque? If taking them and combining them into something that's more palatable for NF tables. Basically, what we do want to have, I mean, first step would be to convert to convert your um, yep. IP tables rules to NF tables, of course. Yep. And what we would like to have at some point is um, an optimizer in user space yeah. or multiple optimizers, which uh, just take your rule set, um, try to analyze structure, uh, mm -hmm. rearrange stuff. And um, basically, this wouldn't be for IP tables specifically, but for NF tables, of course. So first step would be to convert your rule set and then take advantage of an optimizer uh, at some point. Right. I've started um, the set infrastructure is actually meant to support uh, building more complex data structures in the kernel uh, from user space. And one of the main goals was to be able to express something like the high pack algorithm completely in user space. Um, okay. I've been trying, I've been starting to work on that a little. Um, I stopped at some point. It will happen at some point that we're going to do that. Okay. And I guess it just takes, I mean, at some point when I find two, three, four weeks um, to get some basic implementation going where we can try to expand it. And, and it has lots of difficult uh, cases. The basic optimization phase is not too hard to do, but translating it in the re reverse direction, um, trying to handle updates, and at that point you need to transform one tree into a different tree and, and stuff like that. This is quite complicated, but the basic optimi optimization, optimization step is uh, not too hard to do. Okay. Yeah, there uh, is also some some code still not yet in in the tree that should allow should provide the the, the missing glue code so you can uh, reload your IP, IP tables rule set with the IP tables compat. And currently, if you try to list it with NFT, it breaks. So okay. with the with the missing code, um, we will use a special syntax. So you will see your IP tables rules. You, you can start translating them to, to native if possible. But if, if, for example, let's say we, for example, don't have hash limit, right. you, can, you will be able to use the native X tables extensions mixed with. Oh, right, right. So it's just a way to provide um, uh, an easy way to transition while we, we don't have uh, native um, support for what X tables okay, provide. Yeah. So I think that's pretty much all we had to cover. Uh, was there any other questions that didn't come up during the, the talk? Or thanks for sending patches. I think I told you yesterday, but I mean every time that we hit a bug, um, I mean just the effort to 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 just to diagnose it and. Oh yeah, sure. So. It, hopefully they'll keep coming. So. <laughs> uh, all right. I think that was the end of our talk. Did you guys want to go ahead and continue on with the NF tables? tutorial if people are interested I can um, I have something specific about um, the NF table sets um, like the upcoming features and what we're planning to do short term now um, I can talk about that yeah I think we have time so there's only we about looks like 35 minutes left so yeah Great. thank you <laughs>